Let's turn in our hymnals over to number 881. And let's unite together in this historic affirmation of the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. That's 881. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll be starting confirmation baptism classes this week. And, uh, and the study is going to be centered around our profession of faith. If anybody asks you what you believe, we ought to be able to each one just simply spit that back out without even thinking about it. But hopefully we need to think about it a little bit as well. But uh, we'll be teaching these children a bunch about the faith, but mainly, mainly about salvation, because that is what they're confirming, and that's what they're accepting, is the salvation that Jesus offers. There was a woman telling about her family going to the movies, and prior to the movie starting, her husband went out to the snack bar and loaded up all popcorn and candy and drinks. And he entered back into the theater and the lights had gone down a little bit. She could see him going up and down the aisles, looking up and down each row, searching. He had obviously forgotten where his family was seated. What's worse, it was obvious that he couldn't even remember which section of the theater they were in, be at the front, the back, the left, or the right. So he searched in the dim light. And so it is when we get our mind affixed with popcorn and candy and chocolates and such. And wouldn't you know it be the husband in this predicament? Finally the lights dimmed a little bit more. And he looked around and shouted, Does anyone recognize me? <laughs> now my family, I wouldn't have run into that problem because they'd have been running over people to get to the popcorn and candy I was carrying. But today we're looking at a man who's going through the shadows and darkness. And he's hoping that nobody will recognize him. This is the very reason this individual is traveling by night to begin with. He doesn't want anyone to know that he's going to see Jesus. He's embarrassed. You ever been really embarrassed? I bet we all have at one time or another. There have been an occasion where you didn't want someone to see you or didn't want anyone to see you. Have there been times you just felt like crawling in a hole? Have you ever embarrassed yourself that badly? We all know what it feels like to be embarrassed. Anybody like to share a moment of embarrassment with us this morning? <laughs> yes, yeah, sometimes. Lord, I've had plenty enough times to to think about. I remember I had a pastor up in Bristol once a long time ago. Long time ago. He's passed away now, but I was over on the Virginia side. And you know why well, there's so many more wrecks over on the Virginia side, don't you? 
It's Tennessee, and this has gone over there to buy cheap beer, cigarettes, and lotto tickets. <laughs> but I was going into the food city, and and there was my pastor at the machine there getting some lotto tickets. And I bumped him and said, are you winning anything? And I didn't think anything of it. He looked at me. He looked like he'd seen a ghost. <laughs> and you know what was so funny about it is, to me, that'd be just like throwing away a dollar. You know, I wouldn't think anything of it. But to him, to him, he later told me one time that he used to have a problem with gambling. And so I had really stepped into his problem area at the time and just hadn't even realized it. But oh, I'd say he was probably covering his head while he was going out of that place. Poor guy. Sometimes in life we might not want the light to expose us. And so it was with Nicodemus. Came through the shadows to see Jesus. And he was a member of the Sanhedrin. He had been very, very well respected in the community. He came secretly to see Jesus. And yet his questions to Jesus were very sincere. We're looking over at John chapter 3, verse number 1, if you'd like to turn there with me. As we approach Easter, I always love this time where we run into this strange traveler in the night called Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. Verse number 1, John chapter 3, and John 3.16 will be another verse that the children will hopefully have memorized by the time we're finished with confirmation. I hope to put just enough repetition into this thing to where they'll get a, a, a grasp of all the major points and yet have some things just ingrained. And there's no better verses than John 3.16, or verse than John 3.16. We're starting at verse 1. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. That'd be the Sanhedrin. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if he were not, if God were not with him. Right off the bat, that's a pretty decent affirmation, isn't it? We know you're from God. Otherwise, you couldn't do what you're doing. Now, Nicodemus had a lot to lose by having an association with Jesus. Politics, politics can turn like the wind because people can turn like the wind. The crowd can turn like the wind. And you know how politics are today. Or in any age. Democrats, Republicans alike have concerns over who they get their picture taken with. Because you never know what's just down the road. I remember I had an Old Testament professor I just loved to death. And uh, I asked if I could get my picture taken with him one time. He agreed and had somebody take a picture. And I said, now, now if I end up train directed my ministry or getting in a whole bunch of trouble, I'll take your picture down from my office. And he looked and shook his head and he said, and likewise, <laughs> likewise, if I get in a big mess, you can do the same. Nicodemus has a lot of stake here. He has a lot of earthly things at stake. So he met Jesus with an affirmation. We know you're a teacher from God. And one might want to reply, well, if you know that, why are you sneaking in at night to see me? And Jesus will say as much in just a little bit. But I want you to realize Jesus Jesus begins this conversation oddly. Jesus doesn't mess around with small talk. And it's one of the most interesting things in this verse. 
to me. That, that Jesus, I would suggest to you, already knows what's on Nicodemus' mind before he even gets there. Jesus cuts to chase, saying something that would seem to be just totally out of place or totally out of the blue. But I'll guarantee you it was not. I'll guarantee you this was exactly what Nicodemus had been thinking about his whole way there. You see, Jesus had this way about him. You recall, Nathaniel come to see Jesus and Jesus saying something about the fig tree and Nathaniel knew this was God in flesh before him. Even in the dark, Jesus knows us. He knows us through and through. So Jesus responds oddly to this greeting. In verse 3, in reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Verse 4, how can a man be born when he's old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again. And you'll notice here, Nicodemus didn't miss a beat, did he? He didn't say, Jesus, why are you changing the subject so quickly? Well, why aren't you saying something that has something to do with my honorable greeting to you? You know, he doesn't miss a beat. He immediately responds to the question, basically saying, how can this be possible? How can this be? You know, when I first began ministry, I felt sorry for Nicodemus. I thought that he was ignorant. I wanted to say, Nicodemus, he's talking in metaphor to you. He's not talking about actually being born again physically. Poor Nicodemus. And I thought, Jesus, he came there sincerely asking you a question. Why couldn't you have explained it a little bit better to him? He had a sincere heart. But I'd say to you today, Nicodemus knew Jesus was speaking metaphorically. And I would also suggest to you, so was Nicodemus. You don't get to the head council in the land being about half baked, you know? Nicodemus knew what Jesus was saying, and, and he knew what he was saying as well. How can this be possible to go into the mother's womb once again and be born? What Nicodemus is saying back to Jesus is, can you teach an old dog new tricks? Once you're so set in your ways, I'd say to you, he knew what Jesus was saying. And that's why it was bothering him so. And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the Spirit. You know, some commentators have differed through the ages on the meaning of water. If you're Baptist, it'll definitely mean baptism. If you're something else, it might mean something else too. If I had to choose what it represents, the water, I would suggest to you, represents the physical birth, first and foremost. Because the very next sentence, and when you're trying to figure out something in the Bible, a lot of times it will repeat itself a verse later if you look real close. The next verse says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. So the waters of birth is one thing pointed to here, but then again, then again, it may have represented much more than just physical birth. You see, Nicodemus would have been all too familiar with all the ritual washings that they required. That's pretty much their religion. They wanted you to 
baptismal uh, this, that, and the other. It says even couches. Even couches. They had all these ritual washings. You remember the water Jesus turned into wine? All those huge vases? Those were baptismal. They were there for ritual purification. So Jesus may have been pointing not only to the physical birth, but rather also to all of the rituals that they carried on with. You realize that John the Baptist, not too long ago, said, I baptize you with water, but the one coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie will baptize you with the Spirit. Okay? So it, the physical represents physical birth, but all that the Pharisees do is simply physical as well. Remember Jesus saying, you wash the cup on the outside, but leave it filthy on the inside. That's physical. That's the outward. But he's saying something's got to happen to us spiritually on the inside. Something that deals with the heart. Don't think that I'm saying to you baptism is a requirement of salvation. I would just about guarantee you Judas was baptized. And his eternal estate certainly doesn't look real promising, does it? As a matter of fact, Jesus said it'd be better for that man had he never been born. That's a pretty strong statement. And I suggest to you as well, the thief on the cross to whom Jesus said, this day we will be in paradise together, probably wasn't baptized. Nicodemus had had focus just on all the little physical acts. And some churches will just focus on that as well. So, Nicodemus would have been familiar with all the ritual washings. He knows what it means to wash it outside of the cup. Something else that stands out here is Jesus' use of the word spirit or wind. It blows where it will. It blows where it will. The word spirit, pneuma, we get our word what? Pneumonia from that. Wind. 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 It blows where it will. That simply don't sound real good to the Pharisees either. Because they want to be in control of everything and everybody. And this is something outside of the grass. This is something that's hard for all the enemies to swallow as well, I'm sure. And Jesus would so often use things around him for illustrations. You suppose maybe it's a windy night? You think maybe they can hear the wind blowing as Jesus says some of these things. Maybe there's water running in the distance. Verse 7 says, You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. It is with everyone. So it is with everyone born of spirit. When we have the Holy Spirit put in us, all oh, He ought to shine through. But ultimately, God's in control. And He says, how can this be? Verse 9. Nicodemus is understanding what he's saying. How can this be? He don't think Jesus is saying you've got to be physically born again by your mother. No, he understands what Jesus is saying. He says, how can this be? It's something hard for Nicodemus to follow. <coughs> and Nicodemus doesn't try to change the subject either. He is addressing exactly what he came there to hear. All the physical rituals fall short. What's more, it's not the Pharisees or anyone else who controls the process. Sometimes we as Christians can focus too much on the physical because it's hard to measure the spiritual, isn't it? Only God knows the ultimate truths. 
Jesus is showing Nicodemus that spiritual birth brings about a radical transformation that involves the will and the power of God as He puts His Spirit within us. And sometimes that spirit will, lead us, spirit will lead us into the sunshine when we don't want to be seen by anybody, you know? And Jesus continues. Remember I told you He's going to chastise Nicodemus as well. Here it comes. Verse number 10. You are Israel's leader, Jesus said. And do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know. We testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Now there's a statement. Remember, we saw earlier that Nicodemus made an affirmation. He believed Jesus to be from God. And Jesus pretty much said the same thing, but said it in a clearer way. I don't think that was quite what Nicodemus meant, do you? Jesus tells Nicodemus he's from heaven. He's the only one from heaven. And if Nicodemus is going to get mad and leave the conversation, right here's the time. But he doesn't. He doesn't. He's just standing there wide-eyed. Scratching his head, I suppose. As a boy, I used to trade guitars a whole lot. I'd walk a long way to get down to the guitar center. Oh, I was maybe 15 or 16 years old. And old Paul Robinson ran the guitar store there. I think Paul may have been a rabbi. I'm not real sure. He certainly knew how to deal in a wheel. Wheel and deal. But Paul, if I was working a good deal, he had this look on his face. It was a painful look. And the longer he'd hold that expression, the better deal I knew I was working. When I make him an offer, that's what he do. And eventually, I'm talking now a little bit more. I was 15 years old, and Lord mercy, already learned a little bit about business there. But I'm imagining that Nicodemus is, he's got that same pain. Look, how can this be? How can I change everything I've been brought up with and believe? And Jesus says to him in verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. Woo! Eternal life is contingent upon Jesus. Now the Pharisees believed in eternal life. So this is hitting home with one of their beliefs. Remember I told you I repeat this, the Sadducees didn't. They ran the temple and everything. And what they got right here is pretty much what they had. You know? And Nicodemus would have known exactly what Jesus was talking about, about just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. You all remember the story. Serpents biting the children of Israel. And the Lord told Moses to make an image of a serpent and stand it up on a pole. And don't that draw a picture for us? And Jesus is pointing us to it. And when somebody was bitten by one of these deadly serpents, they would go to the pole, they would look upon the image, and they would be healed. Or at least they wouldn't die. You know, our medical association symbol is pretty much the same thing, isn't it? Jesus is telling Nicodemus something very important here too. The Son of Man must be lifted up. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all people to me. I'm sure Nicodemus' expression has even changed a little more by this time. What do you think? 
But he didn't know just exactly what Jesus was talking about. It's about faith. It operates by faith. And I've always expressed it even when we come here each year to, to this odd individual in Scripture that if you were out there in the middle of the wilderness, you got bit by one of these snakes, you've seen somebody die from this before, probably on multiple occasions, and Moses had said, go look at the pole with the serpent upon it, and you'll be healed and you won't die. Or you don't have a whole lot of conversation on your way to that pole. Well, so-and-so says this and that. I don't think it really matters exactly what you believe concerning if you just think about the poll. You'd be saying basically, get out of my way. Get out of my way or get run over. I'm heading to the pole. Been bit, don't die, headed to the pole. And looking upon that in faith. That is the faith to which we're called for our salvation. Out of the way, I'm headed to the pole. And that is the way we come to Jesus in an absolute hope in His grace. In absolute faith. Now Jesus concludes here with the Gospel. 3.16 For God so loved the world and gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but shall have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he's not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And Jesus concludes with an indictment here pointed right at Nicodemus. Verse 19, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because, of their, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, but will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. That's just exactly what Nicodemus has just done, isn't it? But whoever lives by truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. So there stands Nicodemus in the darkness, and we're wondering just how much of this he's absorbed, how much of it he's understood, what's going to become of Nicodemus. One thing I've always pondered in Scripture was some of these people that we see that walk away from Jesus sadly may have been back. Rich young man, you ever wonder if maybe that was Joseph of Arimathea? It's the way he works, you know. Once he gets hold of you, he has a tendency not to let you go. Because we all trip up and make mistakes. And I wondered and wondered about Nick Davis and oh, I just uh, I, I just Wondered and wondered what would come of him. Was he continuing to be ashamed to know anything about Jesus? You know, on Easter morning, we stand out there and sing in the sunshine where anybody that passes by can see us. I'll come out there for the sunrise service. What if we didn't have a building and we were just out there in the middle of the field and every car passing by we could just wave at them as we sang. How would you feel about that? Would you be proud to be a Christian? I hope so. And I'll bet each and every one of you would. But I wondered about old Nicodemus. He had certainly been ashamed. One day I read John 19.38 which told us Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph 
was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. And he was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped in, with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Whose tomb was that? Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. You know, when I read those words, I can still remember the day. I just felt like shouting, Hallelujah, he did understand. And there's Nicodemus in broad daylight, wherever I could see. Not only wherever I could see, but at the worst time in the world that anybody could ever be associated with Jesus. His own disciples had fled. But there's Nicodemus, wherever I to see. What must it have looked like to Nicodemus as he saw Jesus stretched out upon that cross? Do those words come back when you see the Son of Man lifted up? Oh, and what does it bring? It brings salvation. It brings healing. It brings newness. It brings all you can ever hope for. Well, serving it much good without a challenge. And I'll leave you with a challenge. Listen to the Spirit. Ask Him where you would shine the best at here in this coming week and shine for it wherever I can see. He wants you to shine in the darkness as well. You realize of all those I am statements that Jesus said, there was one thing He said, I am, and you are too. And that one thing is light. You are the light of the world because He is. Do I have some helpers this morning for communion?